we happy to see you here at Harrison Public Library. During our summer reading event that was based uh, on a uh, book of Susie Orman Schnell, we came here to shine um, about 1939 uh, World's Fair in New York. Um, we invited Dr. Amy Ruffalo um, to give us a presentation on 1939 World's Fair. And it was very well received and people wanted to talk more. So we asked Dr. Ruffalo to come back today and talk about 1964's World's Fair. So Amy Ruffalo has a PhD degree from, CUNY, from the CUNY Graduate Center and a master's degree from the Institute of Fine Arts in Contemporary Art History. For the past two years, she worked at the Queens Museum and she done extensive archival research into the museum's collection, including its 1939 and 1964 World Fair objects and memorabilia. So Amy is the right person to talk about World Fairs. So, and right now I am going to welcome Dr. Amy Ruffle. Thank you. So thank you so much, Kalina. Thanks for having me back. I think the 64, 65 fair is what actually everyone wanted to hear about the first time. I also wanted to, my doctorate's in our history. It's not in the world fairs, it's not in general history. So there's definitely people who could, who are better experts at this. I know a lot of you even went to the fair and I was wondering if, I'm not sure if people without videos can do the thumbs up, but can people do the thumbs up if you actually went to the 64 fair? Wow. Okay, so that's a lot of you. So obviously I wasn't even born yet. <laughs> so my perspective is gonna be a little different. And I'm hoping that like when we get to the Q&A and also when you, you know, in the chat, please feel free to put your experiences. I'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, but this lecture, like before, it's designed to be for someone without any prior knowledge of the fair. So. Maybe you'll learn something new if you're an expert, maybe not. If anything, it's always good to see some other World Fair fans, I think. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. I just want to mention that I see our chat and people uh, talking about their experience and about their families and visiting the fair. So it's really exciting. So one thing I wanted to mention, so we have a brand new, not super brand new, but a couple months now, a new collections manager at the museum. And I talked to her about so many people have objects from the world's fairs and just wanted to give you the email address if you are thinking about donating them or uh, want to give any objects to the Queens Museum or if we're open to submissions. I'll also have this email address on the last slide um, if you'd like to write it down later. So basically, the official theme of this fair was peace through understanding. Many people have pointed out how ironic and tone deaf this theme was at the time, considering that the world and New York City was anything but peaceful. This is just a very broad overview of what's going on in the world right now. You have JFK, who was president when the fair was first started, but he was assassinated before it opened. Lyndon Johnson became the president. And this is a photo of JFK in 1962 when he came to Queens to dedicate the federal building. It was during the groundbreaking ceremony. So also in the 60s around this time, the Cold War started in 1962 uh, after the Soviet Union installed nuclear missiles in Cuba, leading to the Cuban Missile Conflict. Definitely not peace through understanding. There's also this time between the US and the USSR, this space race, this idea of who can get to outer space and the moon fastest. Also in the backdrop of this fair is the civil rights movement. There's lots of social unrest across the country and this definitely seeps into New York as well. Just during the fair, Lyndon Johnson signed into law the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Malcolm X was assassinated, the Montgomery marches happened and the Watts, famous Watts riots in LA also occurred. So a lot was going on in the world that 
was very much not piece through understanding. So to back up a little bit for anyone brand new to the subject, so what is a World's Fair? Just at its very basic, it's a gathering of people, companies, and nations from all over the world, and they come together to demonstrate and introduce things like products, technology, arts, advancement. It's really a tool for communication and promotion and for relationship building. It also promotes the host city. It helps bring money and jobs to that city. And it's also an opportunity to revitalize certain areas and hopefully put down things that can serve that city after the fair is over. And World Fair started in the mid 19th century, which makes sense as the age of enlightenment, the, the idea of bringing out ideas and putting, putting them out there to the public. The first fair was in 1851 in London with their famous Crystal Palace. Uh, this is Paris in 1989. They built their Eiffel Tower for their World's Fair, another famous one. And then, of course, we have our two World Fairs in New York, the one in 1939 and 1964. So World Fairs are still going on today. Dubai was actually meant to do one for 2020, but because of COVID, they postponed it to 2021. And the last one in the U.S. was in 1984 in Louisiana World Expo. So last time I talked about the 1939 World's Fair. At the time, Robert Moses was the parks commissioner. He hoped that a fair would revitalize uh, the area and raise money to turn to create his dream park. So this site where the 1939 World's Fair took place was originally an ash dump. So this is what it looked like before it became a park. You can kind of see this is a before and after picture. And this was Mount Corona. This is a, a mountain of ash in this ash dump. So it was this big eyesore, about 1,200 acres. Moses hoped that the 1939 fair would pump money into it to help him create his dream park, uh, but it ended up losing a lot of money and didn't happen. The World Fair of 39, its theme was building the world of tomorrow. 44 million people came. It's generally remembered more fondly in some ways in the 64 fair. It was kind of a perfect moment when people are coming out of the depression. It kind of reflected this new optimism uh, of looking to the future. So because of that, kind of achieved near mythical status, really. But like I mentioned, it had gone bankrupt, no money left over to invest in the park. And just quickly, the Tryon and Paris sphere, they were the symbols of the fair right directly in the center. This was kind of the beginning of merchandising. So they're literally all over any kind of product you can think of. Afterwards, the only buildings that really remained in Flushy Meadows Corona Park were the amphitheater and the New York City building, which became the Queen's Museum in 1972. Both of these buildings were again used for the 64 fair, but otherwise everything else was demolished. So the idea to have another fair in the 60s was first floated in 1958. It gained traction mainly because people thought it would make money. But New York City was also trying to think of a way to commemorate its 300th anniversary of the founding of New York by the Dutch, which would be 1964, and thought it would be perfect. Uh, and this stamp kind of shows this, this moment to commemorate the anniversary. On the right, this was actually the, one of the first original logos for the fair. Shows this rotating earth. You can see the rotation here and the Big Dipper. So major businessmen and politicians, they spent years lobbying DC and foreign bureaucrats. Uh, lots of politics ins and outs try to get this fair to happen in New York. Robert Moses was involved. He was at the time the parks commissioner still, and he offered to rent Fleshy Meadows Corona Park for $1 a year. Made sense to have it there. There's a lot of infrastructure still left over from the first World, World's Fair, and also close to a lot of transportation hubs in the city. But Robert Moses, since 1940, he had become quite a big deal. He had consolidated his power and built a ton of projects in New York. 
And by the 60s, other than Parks Commissioner, he held about a dozen other unelected positions in the government. So his, his famous rise to power was chronicled famously by Robert Caro in The Power Broker. These are just a few of Robert Moses's major reconstruction projects in New York City. He made set, he constructed seven major bridges, public housing, pools, zoos, playgrounds, beaches, but above all, what he was most proud of were his public parks and roads. And what's funny is he was obsessed with cars, but he actually had never learned to drive. And now that the second fair was happening at Plushy Meadows Corona Park, he was hoping that this time he could make money to build his dream park. Um, but after he rented the, the park to these people, they decided that he would actually make a great president of the fair, mainly because of the power and influence that he had gained and the experience that he had in, in all these major public works for the city. But I should also mention that despite his accomplishments, Robert Moses is pretty notorious character. He transformed New York City, but often at the cost of low income, people of color neighborhoods that were displaced, sometimes without any plans of where to relocate them. He was basically a dictator that steamrolled people, uh, which was what he brought to the fair. He actually caused a lot of trauma, but he also got a lot done. So building the fair was a huge undertaking. The construction included 14 miles of water mains, 103 miles of electric cables, 250,000 tons of steel. And in 1963, 6,600 men worked at the fair site. And it's kind of interesting that so much is put into a site making all these buildings that are gonna be taken down in two years. They're all meant to be temporary. That also kind of created an opportunity in that architects and pavilions, people who hosted these spaces, could be as wild and crazy with their ideas as they like and really experiment. So on April 22nd, 1963, this one year before the fair opened, JFK, he dialed 1964 on, in his Oval Office on a new touchtone phone. And this was a new invention and it was going to be on display at the fair. And by dialing this number, he activated the countdown clock. So this was a promotional tool, but also a way to again, kind of promote this new technology and create buzz around the event. So again, the theme was peace through understanding and you can see it all over the place <laughs> along with the Unisphere, which we'll talk about in a second. The unofficial themes were man's achievements on a shrinking goal in an expanding universe and the Olympics of progress. So the overall, the design of the fair, Moses turned down the design committee's idea, which wasn't this, but it was like this. It was kind of based on Baron Haussmann who designed this for the Paris World's Fair in 1867, basically to have this huge donut shaped building that would house all the pavilions. Uh, Moses really wanted a more eclectic approach. He wanted there to be something for everyone, but more practically, if people designed and built their own pavilions, they'd also pay for it. Making this massive exhibition space to hold everything would have cost the city a lot of money. And part of the reason the 39 fair lost a lot of money was because there was this kind of more unified design, even if it might have looked gather, better, uh, according to most of the critics. Uh, this is actually a picture of the scaled model we have at the Queens Museum of the 64 Fair. This is one of seven miniature models that were created to be portable. So it would travel around to different cities in order to drum up ticket sales and also to, to convince exhibitors to rent space in the, in the fair. So the Unisphere, I'm sure this is, I hope this is recognizable to almost all of you. It's a symbol of the fair. It's where the Trilon and Paris Fair had stood for the 39 World's Fair. It's 12 stories high, 900,000 pounds, and it's made out of stainless steel. Uh, not surprisingly, it was, it was paid for by U.S. Steel. So this was a great way to show off their product, show what it could do. Um, 
and they, they gave it to the fair as a permanent gift. So that's why it's still there today. The original concept for the Unisphere was actually to have it rotate on its base uh, with fountains that would spew out underneath it to look like it was floating, but they found that to be impractical. Practical. So this is the design that they ultimately settled on. And the three rings that circle the globe are the first man-made satellites that launched during the space age. So just like the Trilon and Paris sphere, the Unisphere is on everything. I still haven't counted all of the images of the Unisphere we have in our exhibit, but I'm sure there's probably hundreds. Uh, and it's definitely driven, I think, a huge culture of memorabilia and collecting that, you know, are all over social media at this point. But yeah, produced a lot of merchandise. So this is opening day of the fair. President Johnson came to um, give the keynote address. He cut the ribbon for the U.S. pavilion. Remember, at this point, he had just become president. He had been president for about four months. And during the ceremony, he was actually heckled by protesters. The mayor of New York at the time, Robert Wagner, he said, today we may be marking the end of one era and the beginning of another. And in retrospect, it speaks to a major shift in US culture and politics at the time, especially in New York City. There's lots of tension that I'd mentioned, crime and poverty, pollution was at an all time high. And with this hecklers were kind of this indicator of that, right? So in relation to the civil rights movement, there are a bunch of protests related to racial discrimination on opening day of the fair. Leading up to the fair, there was, like I had mentioned, general social unrest in New York from several race-related issues, including police brutality and lack of jobs. But there were also protests aimed directly at the World's Fair. It brought a lot of jobs to the city, but these these jobs were mainly towards white men. So actually only two black people on the fair staff were both secretaries. So the Urban League of Greater New York uh, had been lobbying the World's Fair to hire more African-American and Puerto Rican workers. Uh, also in the months leading up to the fair, CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, started planning a Stalin, which they planned to basically uh, run out of gas on all the highways to make it impossible to get to the World's Fair. So basically this idea of civic disruption, making sure that people couldn't arrive on opening day, it's a nonviolent approach, very typical civil rights movement, kind of this good trouble, civil disobedience. This Stalin actually didn't uh, end up happening. The city filled the highways with cops. They had fair enough, like a long, uh, period of warning to prepare, but it did make an impact. A lot of, uh, some say that it affected the numbers on opening day. On opening day itself, since the Stalin didn't work, there was a lot of small scale protests, including on the subway. Um, protesters refused to let the doors close. And the subways are one of the main arteries to the fair. So again, this kind of disrupted, you know, having people come to the fair. They also occupied or, or picketed in front of pavilions, including the New York City building, which later becomes the Queens Museum. And in addition to the general lack of jobs at the fair, they were also protesting certain exhibits. Like, so for example, the Louisiana Pavilion had an exhibit basically celebrating Jim Crow uh, policies. So the police commissioner, Murphy, uh, he's the only one to really grasp the significance of Johnson and the hecklers. He said it was a day in which the president came to the world of fantasy and encountered the world of fact, a day millions will never forget. Sorry. So for opening day, the turnout, as I mentioned, was lower than expected. Uh, Moses had expected 250,000 people and only about 92,000 showed up. Part of the problem was that it was raining. Bad luck. On opening day, they had a huge parade. This is the only image I could find, which is really a shame because the description of the parade is bonkers. 
Um, I'm going to read some of it for you. It included bagpipers from three countries, Chinese drummers, Montana cowboys, Japanese geishas, Spanish guitarists, flamenco dancers, a marching band, horse John beer wagon from Germany, Israel accordionist, and a steel drum troupe from the Caribbean. Uh, but this is the only picture I could find of these women on a boat. But anyway, seemed like a good fun opening day. I should also mention and note that I, it's, the dash is important, 64 to 65. The fair occurred over two six month seasons over two years. Um, basically the fair stayed the same more or less. Some pavilions left, some pavilions were finished and opened the second year. Uh, but generally that's, I think, from October, November for six months over two years, just to give you a better idea. It was also promoted heavily as the $1 billion fair, which is a bit of an exaggeration. It didn't cost $1 billion to do the World's Fair, but if you include all the neighboring highway projects and the construction of Shea Stadium, which was also happening at the time, then Moses kind of pushed this claim that it was the $1 billion fair. It very much went in line with his idea that it was the biggest and best fair uh, and most popular that has ever existed. So here is a map of the fair just to kind of orient you if you've been to the area. This is the Queens Museum now. Uh, Met Stadium is over here. LaGuardia is over here. Manhattan is this way. So there's five main areas. Industrial, international, federal and state area, and transportation area and the lake amusement area. So the lake amusement area, we're not going to talk much about it, is usually deserted. Not super successful. Moses was a conservative. He wanted good, clean fun. He didn't want any of the raunchy stuff for gambling, nudie shows from the 39 fair. So this was kind of a sanitized area of good, clean fun. There's a kiddie park and a circus. Uh, wasn't very successful. So just to kind of, I had mentioned before, world fairs are a place to show new inventions um, and new technology. And here's a few technologies that were promoted at the fair. One was a jet pack. Uh, it could only fly for 20 seconds and go over very short distances. It didn't really catch on. Uh, the color TV at the RCA pavilion, this had been introduced already, but it was one of, it was still a novel idea. The picture phone at Bell Telephone down here. This is a ancestor to FaceTime and maybe even Zoom. And then also the IBM computer, which produced mainly lists. It wasn't exactly visually that exciting. But anyway, computers are starting to become the thing. So besides these kind of inventions, I'm also going to talk about a few of the pavilions, mostly the highlights. So this is U.S. Royal Tire. It was in the transportation area. It had this ludicrous 80 foot tall Ferris wheel shaped like a gigantic rubber tire. There's, there's lots of memorabilia and toys created of this. We have the, uh, a miniature version of it in our collection. It's one of my most favorite things ever. When the fair ended in 1965, the tire was disassembled and shipped to Detroit. Uh, with 22 trucks. It was re reassembled without its gondolas outside the Uniroyal office. Later on when the office moved, the tire stayed there and so then it just kind of became a symbol of Detroit in the, in the automobile industry. So this is probably the most popular or one of the most mentioned exhibits at the, at the fair. This is what everyone talks about when you ask them what their favorite memory was. The Belgian Village. It's basically, it was actually the largest international exhibit. It was a meticulous copy of a medieval Flemish village, as it, or not medieval, as it would have appeared in 1800. There's beer gardens, houses, a 15th century Gothic church, a replica of it, a canal with a stone bridge, but what everyone talks about is the Belgian waffles, which were introduced to the American public. 
the stand was one of the most popular. They served over 2,500 waffles a day. Uh, and fun fact, the recipe was actually originally for Brussels waffles, but nobody knew where Brussels was, so they renamed them Belgian waffles. So this is another crazy, amazing pavilion, the IBM building, or National Business Machines. It was designed by the famous architect Aro Saarinen, who had also designed the TWA Flight Center at JFK Airport. And it was also done in collaboration with the designer, Charles Eames, who made the famous Eames chair. And they made this huge industrial egg, 90 feet high. It's covered with letters IBM, repeated nearly a thousand times. Around it is this forest of 45 metallic trees. Inside uh, was what they called the people, people wall, which you can see here. Basically what this people, people wall did is that it could seat about 500 people and it would move upwards into the theater. And they would see all of these like many screens at this kind of spectacle. Um, and they watched a show called The Information Machine. It's a 12 minute multi-screen spectacle, basically. Uh, another very famous aspect of the fair spanned a few pavilions. The famous Walt Disney was heavily involved in this fair. He saw an opportunity, a way to kind of test his ideas. And it helped that he had along with Moses. They were of the same generation. So he helped with these four pavilions, the Pepsi Cola, General Electric, General Electric, Illinois, and Ford. And in the end, the fair actually really, you know, helped him work out the kinks. He opened Walt Disney World in Orlando in 1971. And the experimental prototype community of tomorrow, or Epcot, in 1982. And if you think about Epcot, it's a collection of nations in miniature. It's basically like a world's fair in, in the miniature. So Pepsi Cola's pavilion was sponsored by UNICEF and, and Pepsi. And they're most famous for this nine minute ride where you sail around the globe in a small boat to singing, singing puppets that represent the children of the world. So this is where the small world was born in the 1964-65 World's Fair before it moved down to Orlando. At first, they had wanted the, the children to sing all of their national anthems simultaneously, but thought that that would be too <laughs> stressful. So they came up with this song, It's a Small World, that could be sung in all languages, simple and catchy. And then this on the right as it's being reconstructed down, down in Orlando and some more images of the puppets. It's debatable whether the Small World song is less irritating than if they were all screaming their own anthems, but you know, it's a national treasure. So Disney also wanted to test out life-size, lifelike automated mannequins he was working on. He called them audio animatronics. They could move, speak, stand, sing, uh, 60s version of Westworld. So he created these audio animatronics in three different pavilions by GE Ford in Illinois. For GE, so General Electric, they're interested in electricity. You would progress through this carousel of progress where you'd go through the years and see people in their homes using different General Electric products and then you move in time to see how things get better through these appliances. So it's this history of electricity from the beginning of the end. And then at the very end, you see this demonstration of nuclear fusion. Another show that included Disney's uh, uh, audio animatronics is the Ford's Magic Skyway. It's basically a 12 minute ride where you go back in time. There's obviously an emphasis on cars. You get into one of these Ford convertibles on a truck, including the new Mustang, which had just debuted. Along the ride, 
There's this audio animatronic dinosaurs, woolly mammoths, and this is on the lower left, uh, an image from the caveman exhibit. And the voice server said, the wheel gave man a new freedom. Now he could leave the waves, the caves behind and travel on to seek his fortune in the wide, wide world. And then, you know, do this in a Ford, right? So this ride was, was super popular. They estimated about 15 million people rode this ride. Okay, so the last moving person invention of Disney was in the Illinois Pavilion. It was the state that Abraham Lincoln called home. So he created this life-size anim animated figure that looks and acts and speaks like Lincoln, and he performed in a 500-seat Lincoln theater. And this, if you, if it's not obvious, later inspired the Hall of Presidents that's down, down in Disney and still there today. So outside of Disney's exhibits, probably one of the mo most other popular uh, exhibits was the Vatican's exhibit. So Moses even said that Michelangelo and Walt Disney are the stars of the show. So the famous Pieta by Michelangelo, made in 1499, this was the first time the work was allowed to leave Italy. Uh, they put it on a ship in a water site, uh, water uh, in a storage, uh, watertight storage container. And then they put it into this very elaborate <laughs> display with blue lights and a ramp that you can move along slowly. So you get to see it for like two minutes after waiting in line for hours. So very kind of dramatic display. So in part because of the fair, so this I'll show you what the statue actually looks like without the blue light. Uh, and you can see the pavilion down here from the air, kind of this interesting early cue. But so in part because of the fair, the Pope actually came to New York. It's the first time a Pope came to the US. He addressed the UN and then went to Yankee Stadium to drive through in a car. Then he came to his fair on the way back to the airport and blessed and blessed the statue. General Motors. So this building, obviously a statement, it's this huge fin, kind of futuristic. Compare this to the building they created for the 39 fair, uh, which I talked about last time. Here, you know, still a statement building. And they also revived the, their very popular Futurama. So their Futurama in 1939 uh, was so popular, they decided to revive it. And in 39, it showed what the future would look like in the 1960s. Now we're in the 1960s, they're showing what the future would be like in the 21st century. So it's that three people to a slow moving car going through all these exhibits, kind of similar to before. And some things they would see, they would see uh, lunar vehicles, underwater hotels, which is this one up here, um, rotating space stations, gigantic highway creating machines that could level rainforests. Uh, but this idea of space, I'd already mentioned before, this idea of the space race was all over the fair, especially with NASA and their space park. A couple of these rockets are still at NYSI today, um, again, in the transportation area, originally in the fair. So their exhibition was behind the Hall of Science. Uh, remember, this is a great way to show progress, what the country is doing, kind of show the U.S.'s progress over the Soviet Union. And besides this kind of obvious display of, of space technology and fervor, the design of the fair in, in a lot of the phone booths and in a lot of the pavilions kind of took on the space age aesthetic. Uh, so these are phone booths and then this is the transportation travel pavilion. They had a half moon on their roof and this is the Kodak pavilion kind of having this moon-like landscape creating their building. So the New York State Pavilion, which is here, it's still there today. It, it was placed near the New York City Pavilion and it was one of the only kind of cutting edge buildings in terms of design at the fair. Uh, it was built by the famous architect 
Philip Johnson. Here's a picture of him. Here is he standing in front of one of his other famous works, which was the Glass House. Uh, sorry, from 1949. So the New York State Pavilion was potentially the most influential piece of architecture at the fair. It was made at kind of the peak of Johnson's career. And there's three components. There's the Tent of Tomorrow, the Observation Towers, and the Theaterama. So I'm gonna start with the Tent of Tomorrow. It's the world's biggest suspension roof. It's larger than a football field. It was made out of 1,500 plastic panels. So no crane was big enough to actually lift it up. It weighed about 2,000 tons. So I had to put it together on the ground and slowly raise it up. And it's supported by 16 of these 100-foot concrete columns. So on the ground, there's this huge map made by the Texaco Oil Company, which was uh, the largest map in the world, it basically showed gas station locations in New York State. Next to the Tent of Tomorrow, you can see these are the three observation towers here, and then this is the Theaterama. Uh, the observation towers were the tallest structures at the fair. They're 220, 226 feet. So the Theaterama was famously decorated with 10 large pop art works. They were some of the only contemporary art at the fair, and in a way, kind of matched the commercial consumerist aspect of the fair because that's what the pop artists were all about. Here you can see a, a few of them. Right here is Work Eat by Robert Indiana. He worked a lot with letters. You probably would recognize his famous love statue with the L-O-V-E that's in Philly and used to be outside the MoMA up until recently. So these are some of the other artists that were involved. Uh, probably some of the most famous now are Rosen or James Rosenquist, Roy Lichtenstein, Robert Rauschenberg, and then also Andy Warhol. So Andy Warhol kind of went an unconventional route with his choice of work. It was 20 by 20 foot work, and that's 25 panels with silt screen images of 22 mugshots of criminals. It caused some controversy with the New York governor, uh, Rockefeller. Most wanted men in crime on a structure that was meant to promote the state, not great, especially, you know, in a fair where the theme is peace through understanding, not about crime. Uh, Rockefeller was also worried it would alienate Italian voters. So Johnson, Philip Johnson, who had commissioned these or brought these artists on board to decorate the theaterama, defended Warhol, but days later, Warhol himself made a request to replace it, said it hadn't been properly installed and that it wasn't valid anymore because one of the guys had been pardoned, so he was no longer a criminal. So then it was painted over with silver paint. Sometimes censorship has the opposite effect though because we're talking about it now. So the New York Pavilion was actually one of the only buildings that remained. From 1964 to 69, after the fair, it became a, a performance and concert space. It hosted uh, such legendary bands as Led Zeppelin and the Grateful Dead. From 1970 to 1974, sorry, that is a typo, not 2000, it became a roller skating rink. Then it was shut down because panels started falling. People were worried it was a safety hazard. So they started repainting the New York Pavilion and restoring it in 2009. And that same year, the building became, uh, achieved state landmark status. So now it's protected. And the Theaterama became the Queen's Theater, which opened in, in 1993. I should also mention a lot of things were filmed here, including The Wiz, and also a lot of uh, Iron Man movies. So other art that's at the fair, Robert Moses wasn't really a huge fan of art. He was kind of extremely conservative in his taste, though he did commission some objects that still remain in the park today, and they remain because he commissioned them to be in bronze, and that would last. If you remember, for 39 World's Fair, mostly everything was in plaster, which isn't made to last, and it wasn't meant to. So you can kind of see these uh, four examples. They all kind of celebrate the space age in a way, 
And last time, so I didn't mention the rocket thrower by Donald DeLue. Uh, it was widely panned in the media. John Canaday, the art critic of the Times, called it the most lamentable monster, making Walt Disney look like Leonardo da Vinci. A little harsh. So the only painting that Moses actually censored, he didn't censor anything in the, in the fair, except for this painting, which is haunting. Uh, this is a, it was um, credited to Walter Keane, but if you've ever seen the movie Big Eyes, you know it's actually his wife's Margaret Keane, Tomorrow Forever. Um, so this is the only art painting that was censored by Moses. So next door to the New York Pavilion is the New York City Pavilion. We talked about this at length last time. It's one of the only surviving buildings of the 39 Fair. After the 39 Fair, it became an ice skating rink and a roller rink. In 40, 1946 to 1950, it became the UN headquarters. And in the 1950s, it became a recreation center again with a skating and a roller rink. The city has the most insane and interesting history. <laughs> I love it. So in 1964, it was remodeled again for the fair. And Moses added the panorama on the north side, which is still there today. And you can come see, the museum is open. So the panorama is, it was meant to be a celebration of the city's municipal infrastructure and all of the projects that Moses had commissioned and seen through. So in some ways it was very much a promotional tool for him. He was meticulous. He only accepted less than 1% margin of error on this thing. He wanted people to see his projects across the city in all their glory. So during the fair, about 1,400 people a day came to see the panorama. They each paid 10 cents for a ride. They would ride in these moving cars that you can see here, which would ride around the perimeter of the model, stimulating, simulating, simulating a helicopter ride. And you would, they would listen to this voiceover as they kind of moved around this largest scaled model in the world. It's about 9,000 square feet, size of two basketball courts. To give you a larger view, now the helicopter cars are gone. Now there's this ramp that used to be where their path was, and you can be in the open air of the space and kind of take your time. So Moses intended for this model to be updated continuously and be used as an urban planning tool. I remember when he made this, there wasn't computers. But since the 60s, it's only been updated a few times. The last major update was in 1992. Uh, to give you a sense of how much it's changed, originally the model had 865,000 buildings. Now it has 895,000. So after the fair, the building became a skating rink again, and in 1971, the north side became, 1972, the north side became the Queen's Museum. In 2008, we got rid of the skating rink and expanded the museum. So not far from the New York City building, three days before the fair closed on October 21st, Westinghouse time capsule was buried. They had buried a previous time capsule in 19. Uh, for the 1939-40 World, World's Fair, which you can see here. They're both relatively in the same spot. It's not meant to be open for 5,000 years. There are some of the objects that represented that moment. Everything from credit cards, bub the Bible, tranquilizer pills, birth control pills, and a ballpoint pen. The day the fair ended, October, in October 1964, people were literally taking flowers, pieces of the fair home with them, breaking things off as souvenirs. Uh, after the fair ended, everything was basically demolished, sold for scrap. Many parts of the World's Fair were sold off and exist elsewhere, uh, kind of like the Small World exhibit. Um, after the demolition, it became Flushing Meadows Corona Park, second largest park in the five boroughs after Pelham Bay Park in the Bronx. Bronx. And Moses didn't really have the money he thought he would, but he did improve the site and a lot of the buildings from the fair remained and were repurposed. So the Hall of Science still remains. There's a new zoo and a botanical garden. Uh, the amphitheater remained for a while. 
the New York State Pavilion remained, and the U.S. Pavilion, the heliport, and the Unisphere, and also what would become the Queen's Museum. So even though the fair was popular, it was also widely criticized. The media called it the world of already and thought it was too commercial and gimmicky, too conservative and streamlined. It was also a financial fiasco. They couldn't, they didn't make any money. They couldn't pay back the loan that New York City had given millions of dollars. Uh, and even though 50 million people did come to the fair, fair which is the most attended World's Fair ever, it, was, it still fell short of the estimate of about, they estimated about 70 million visitors. But generally, the historical takeaway is that a lot was changing in the 60s. The 64 fair was basically run by old white guys that were stuck in the past. They didn't understand the new generation. They didn't understand this obsession with the Beatles. Uh, they didn't understand the social unrest in the city or the country. It was no longer the Eisenhower's, Eisenhower's 1950s. So that's basically where I'm going to wrap up my talk, but I also wanted to mention a few things that I found really great as resources. For one thing, I'd mentioned before that there's so, so many objects and memorabilia produced by the fair or that fair itself. And if you're interested in donating them or have questions, please use this email. One of my favorite resources that I used in preparation for this talk was an interactive map. Uh, at this website. And I can also copy and paste this and put this in the chat so we get into the Q&A. Or you can take a picture with your phone. But this interactive map, it's basically the, the guidebook, but in digital form. So you can click on the map and I'll show you what was written in the guidebook, which I think is really great and interesting. Also, uh, I just wanna plug my own audio tour. So I did an audio tour for the Panorama. It was released to the public a few months ago and and it basically walks you through the history of the panorama and all the five boroughs. I'd also want to emphasize again that the museum is now open. You can go online to our visit page and reserve a ticket. Uh, so please come and thank you. I'm going to stop sharing, but I'm going to put these links in the chat. So don't worry if you didn't write them down. Stop. Thank you, Amy. Fascinating. Now I'm going to unmute everyone and you will be able to ask questions. Also a lot of questions and information and exchange through chat, which was fascinating to read. We have somebody um, joining us today who is going to work on Dubai's uh, World Fair. Oh, so. wow. Yeah, so that's really interesting to hear what uh, will involve in that. So I'm unmuting everyone. Let me make my cursor smaller. It's driving me nuts. <laughs> so yeah, that's the problem with unmuting people. So if you are not talking, please uh, make sure that uh, we don't hear your uh, background noise. So if you unmute yourself sorry do we have any questions i think uh first question do you recognize me i was that cute 12 year old boy went online to the general <laughs> that was me <laughs> <laughs> so the location of the time capsule, it's actually kind of close to where the New York State Pavilion is. Um, I share, I don't want to share my screen again because I'm missing these pieces, but it's, if you look at the New York State Pavilion on the map, it's kind of lower and in that area. Um, if, you mute, if you mute everybody and then let anybody who wants to talk unmute, it would be easier. Yes, right. I can even do that too. If someone, so the people that I can see, if you want to raise your hand to ask a question, can I mute you? It's too distracting with the background. Uh, noise. Why don't you mute everybody? Is there anybody whose faces I can see who wants to ask a question?
you have a question. I think it's over. Okay. Um, right now, I mean, I, I am looking at the chat and there aren't any questions in the chat, but there is a lot of really great memories. Total exhibitor. You also can ask me any questions about the Queen's Museum. I know a lot about the panorama at this point. Um, it was a question about uh, countries uh, uh, protesting and not participating. I mean, can you talk about that? Uh, yes. So, because this fair wasn't officially sanctioned by the BIE, the Bureau of International Expositions, which kind of runs the world's fairs and sanctions them. A lot of European countries didn't actually come to the fairs. I think Spain, definitely Spain, and I think Italy were the only ones that participated. Uh, I know the Soviet Union was going to participate and then they pulled out, obviously, because of the tensions. Uh, in terms of the, the civil and I mean, the civil unrest on, on a national level, I can't think of any uh, states that might have boycotted the fair. Um, but the yeah, Soviet Union, based on world unrest. I never finished typing mine, it went off, so. So, oh, here's a good question. There are 10,000 artifacts at the Queen's Museum. There are roughly 900 visible. When will the other artifacts go live? So right now, so there's been a lot of changes at the museum. We have the new director who's very excited about our World Fair collection and uh, really wants to revitalize our exhibits. And so it's something that we really want to do and are working on. So we don't have a, a set date in mind, but we know how much people love the World's Fair and it's way overdue to be kind of reformatted. And I personally, uh, my next audio tours of, will will definitely feature the World's Fair more so. But that is also um, one thing that I, I, I want, my own personal mission is to try to help the museum as and in any way I can to make that collection more visible to everyone. Uh, sorry, I got here so late, where will the recording be? So the recording will probably be available on YouTube. And I know last time the Harrison Library sent out a link. Yeah. It will be on our YouTube channel. Just probably a day or two to put it together. I'm not sure. So someone asked, the WPA was very involved in the 1939 World's Fair, obviously because it was extremely active at the time. It makes sense. I'm actually not sure what the WPA, if it had a role in the 1964 World's Fair. Well, I don't think it was the WPA in 1964. Yeah. It was so where? It'll be on YouTube. Um, so the current status of the New York State Pavilion, I actually don't know if it's going to be re reopened as something new. Like I said, it, all I do know is that it was recently, relatively recently restored and achieved landmark status. I do know that even if there's nothing happening inside, it's still used as a backdrop for lots of movies. Um, okay, so the controversial Jordan exhibit, there was, uh, someone asked, can you say anything about the controversial Jordan exhibit? So there was the Jordan Pavilion and the Israel Pavilion were right next to each other. And the Jordan Pavilion had a mural that was extremely controversial. It was basically about the conflict between the, the two countries and about the border and the creation of the, uh, the Israel state. And basically the mural, um, it, it talked about basically people being forced for their, from their home as refugees. And it's kind of an interesting, complicated. I don't want to misspeak because um, it's a delicate topic and subject, but there was a lot of uh, controversy between the two and Moses refused to take down the mural. The Israel Pavilion actually created a, a satirical mural the second year, created a lot of, created a lot of buzz. Um, I wish I kind of studied that a little bit more before this so I can give you an even more accurate response, but that is what I remember. So were there any other foods introduced to Americans because of the fair besides Belgian waffles? Well, so one thing that was really great about world fairs is that 
New York City right now, we, you can get any kind of international cuisine that you can think of, really. But in the 30s and in the 60s, a lot of times you weren't introduced to these types of cuisines except for at these fairs. So I'd assume that there's probably a lot of foods introduced to Americans. It's a lot harder. The world in a lot of ways is smaller now. Um, up until recently, it was really easy to travel <laughs> and try things in, in, in other countries. But I don't know anything off the top of my head. Uh, is there any information about the New York World's Fair decanters that would explain the many different bourbon and brand stickers that are on them? I have no idea. Wow, that's a very specific question. I wonder though. Um, is the 1939-40 program you did on YouTube and on the museum website. Yes, it's on the it's on YouTube. If you search my name in World's Fair, I think it should come up. I'm assuming it's on the library's website, um, but I haven't checked recently. With the introduction and immersion of the internet in the world we live in today, do you foresee another World's Fair in the USA? I would say no. It's kind of like outlived its purpose. We don't really need it anymore. We, we have the internet. People can promote things in, in lots of different ways. Like I said, the world feels a lot smaller. But in some ways, it's lived on in other iterations. Like right now, the modern amusement park is really based on what people learn from the world fairs. So, and then it also lives on in terms of like smaller expos or fairs, you know, not necessarily the massive money, uh, money sucking endeavors that you know end up losing their hosts um a lot of money we actually yes. have somebody who mentioned in the chat that is going to work on dubai sphere so if that person is willing to talk and unmute herself or himself and let us know that i'm a he <laughs> Um, I'm in Berkeley, California, actually. Um, yeah, I, I first attended the 82 World's Fair in Knoxville. I wasn't born yet when, uh, for 64, 65. But um, um, it's funny that you should mention food because Expo 2015 in Milan had a food theme, uh, which, of course, really works for Italy. Um, but uh, yeah, Dubai had planned on hosting Expo 2020 which would have opened this month, but has been delayed. But um, the uh, US may actually get to host a, a World's Fair again. Um, Minneapolis St. Paul is uh, looking to, to bid for 2027. They've lost their bid for 2023, the Buenos Aires. And that would have a health theme, which seems even more prescient now. And uh, Houston is also talking about one for 2030. So uh, they still live on. Largest one in history was in 2010 in Shanghai, but not many people know about it in the U.S. I remember that. Yeah. I also want to mention that, you know, I'm not exactly sure what the status is right now with all the shutdowns, uh, but the night market in, in Queens next to Nysai is kind of like, you can think of it as a mini World's Fair too. It's lots of different cuisine from lots of different um, cultures and nations throughout throughout Queens. Uh, oh, there's an article that about foods introduced at the World's Fair. Thank you, Fred, for sharing that. Uh, well, one of the things you can say about food is that with the invasion of uh, Poland in September 1st, to well, became well known Pierre Freyny, who became the um, food critic for the New York Times, stayed on in the United States after um, September 1st, 1939. And so did Henri Soule, um, Soule and they, they began Le Pavillon restaurant on 57th Street. And so the introduction of fine French cuisine resulted from the fact that they came over for the World's Fair and remained. Oh, interesting. Thanks, Robin, for sharing. Okay. 
Um, so someone asked me, someone wrote, with so many millions visiting the fair, how could it have not turned a profit? Was there any serious mismanagement, malfeasance in management? And I would say, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, so, I mean, there was a lot of, um, well, what I've read, I'm going to summarize and say cook in the books maybe a little bit. You know, the executives of the fair were known to kind of take these extravagant trips to Europe with their wives and a lot of kind of expense reports um, probably were not necessary. But also, I think probably the main reason it lost so much money is, is the kind of disappointing result of ticket sales. So they projected a lot of what they put into the fair based on the fact that they thought there was going to be 70 million visitors and there ended up only being 50 million. But it's a very, I'm sure, like any of Robert Moses's projects, very long, complicated answer that I can't really answer. But that's kind of my impression from what I've read. I don't know if the Harrison Library has its own YouTube channel. Belina? Oh, Giovanna's. We do. We do. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Uh, and thank you guys. I want to also thank you guys again so much. I thank you in the beginning, <laughs> but this is definitely beyond any amount of people we expected. And they're a, it's a small, it's a small library. We're a small museum. We're limited. So thanks for bearing with us. And thank you. Uh, anyway, I think I, I think I got most of the questions. What, what about the water supply system um, type pop? map that's in the Queen's Museum. Wasn't that created for the World's Fair and then not allowed to be seen because they were concerned? I'm talking, I guess, about yes. wasn't, could you talk about that? Yes, of course. So the, the it's called the relief map. Uh, oh, yeah. oh my god. Well, we call it the watershed model for short, but basically it was created for the 39 World's Fair. And actually, they realized it was too big for the exhibition space, so that they kind of pulled it from being displayed. And it was in storage for a very long time until they decided to put it back on display at the Queen's Museum, where you can still see it today. And it's really kind of typical of what you'd think of, you'd see at the World's Fair in the New York City building, no less, kind of this, this champion of, championing this engineering marvel uh, that created, you know, a system to bring water to millions and millions of people. Uh, the New York City water relief. Oh my God, it's gonna bother me. <laughs> thank, thank you. I mean, we have a couple more questions in the chat. Oh, okay. The relief map of the New York City water supply system. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the mouthful. Sorry, I had to look that up really quick. Um, yes, I will uh, a lot, okay. Uh, sorry, does anyone know why Meadow Lake Terrace Snack Bar had stone image saying 1963 World's Fair? I don't know what a stone image is, and I'm not sure exactly what the Meadow Lake Terrace snack bar is. Is that something that still exists? Anyone wants to point for them? Okay, um, just gonna move on. I think there's nothing new. Um, we have a suggestion that uh, a live tour with you would be a great fundraiser event for Queen's Museum. Yeah, I mean, we're actually, I think we can start having tours, but they have to be limited to 10 people. So, <laughs> plus, you know, um, I mean, we've had so many great tour guides, like, come through our museum, and there's so many great tours of, um, outside of the Queen's Museum, too, by, like, Untap New York and through the New York City Parks Department. Um, but that, uh, thank you for saying that. Um, yeah, the, the park itself, it's kind of, a really weird uh, self-reflexive exercise to do so much research on a building that you work in for the majority of your time for the last couple of years. Um, and being within that park, it's kind of uh, to learn more about the World's Fairs and you can start to envision what things have looked like that are no longer there. It's very surreal. But Untap New York does a great, has done a great tour and I saw uh, 
a digital version of it where they go through and, and look at all the remnants from the two world's oh, fairs. And there's a lot of things that, even after walking through the, the park for years, I never even noticed. Yeah, uh, but really cool. join them during our summer reading event. It was absolutely fantastic. And it's not very expensive to subscribe. They do digital tours. And actually, your 1939 presentation is recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. So if people are interested, that they can do it. Yeah, but I'm a, I love New York history. So there's, there's so many great organizations. Like, we, we live in one of the most interesting cities, I think. Isn't there an old archaeological object in the Queens Museum, the second oldest object in New York City, the uh, stele? Was it, I thought it, perhaps it was left behind by the by the Jordan Pavilion. I mean, I don't know what it's doing there, but it's about a seven-minute walk from the Queens Museum, you know, straight back. There's actually uh, from the Untap tour, I learned about that the marble column, and I'm not exactly yeah. sure from what entry it was, but it's extremely old and it's still there. I think it actually uh, was a part of the pavilion, then it was left. And so it's just this random column standing by itself. And I don't- a Part, I of, the think, part yeah. of the Jordan Pavilion? Yeah. I think it was part of the Jordan Pavilion. I might be making that up, but because uh, it was a long time, time ago that I, I went to that presentation. Co yeah, column of Jir Jirash, they're saying, people are saying. Oh, cool. You guys are so knowledgeable. <laughs> uh, Anyway, what I build scaled models of World's Fair pavilions if anyone's interested. Interesting. So actually one kind of cool thing that I mentioned in our 39 World's Fair talk is that we have little models of pavilions that another kind of um, self-taught model maker made and he like saved little bits of, of buildings that he had found throughout the park and added them to them. Um, but yeah. I love small models because I love I love the panorama. Uh, so someone also asked about we have a little more time. So someone asked about the aquacade. So the aquacade, if you remember from our last presentation for thirty nine, was Billy Rhodes aquacade. It was really super popular, super famous. Everyone loved it. In sixty in the sixty four fair, you know, like I said, the the lake amusement area was kind of deserted. The Aquacade had a new show um, that changed midway, I think. Oh God, I should have looked this up before. Um, but the Aquacade, so it did have shows during the 64, 65 fair. Afterwards, um, it became a public pool for a while. And then it kind of became the shell, shell of a building up until I think uh, when was it? It was taken down, kind of be, it was like became full of graffiti. Someone had also asked me last time about the federal building, uh, which was meant to stay after the 64 World's Fair. And it did, but eventually it wasn't used and attracted a lot of vandalism. Um, and then they eventually just tore it down. I thought I had blamed Robert Moses just because he's easy to blame. But it looks like it wasn't his fault. Does but, Robbie? Do you have a question? Uh, no, I, I was just playing with the. Oh, you figured out the raise your hand button. Yeah, I didn't know what it was for. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I did comment. We visited uh, the Unisphere uh, last year for a uh, for a picnic, and I hadn't seen the fountains on the sixty four fair, and they suddenly suddenly came on, and I was just totally oh, thrilled. Oh, really? I hadn't seen them on in 40 years yeah. and they just came on. This was a, a year ago, May. And while we were there, we were sitting in front of the Queens Museum. I walked over to the bushes and I saw this plaque and I moved the plants out of the way. And I re learned about this, the bomb at the British Pavilion in 39. And I think it was July 4th. Oh, right. Yeah. And the two detectives took it out of the museum and they were killed trying to defuse it. Um, and it was, it's still unsolved. And I never knew that to that. There, there was a plaque there. Yeah, it's right outside the museum to the right in the bushes. Next to the museum? Yeah, walk out the front door to Queens Museum about 10 feet to the right. 
if you're facing the unisphere, walk off to the right, and it's in the bushes, right to the right, right next to the sidewalk. The little yeah. big brass plaque hidden by the bushes, right near the window well, where those fountains were in the window. Okay. Also, when yeah. it's like the unisphere, it's actually so. People used to swim in it a lot in the fountains when they would turn on. They'd actually be they'd come and use the museum bathrooms <laughs> in wet bathing suits. So they they've stopped putting the fountains on as much because of that. I didn't know they were even functional, but they suddenly just came on and it just made the day. It was thrilling to see it again after since nine. It was that was the first big event of my life, coming from New Jersey, and I was just the fair was thrilling. I have a a glass from the fair up. A patient gave me. I still have it. Had it for a couple of years now, and uh, I just I look up everything I can in the fair, and I haven't been in the Queens Museum yet because I haven't had a chance to just go in there and fiddle around with it. But I want to raise my I'll hand. Look at uh, everything. Yeah, you, you should. Yeah. And so, if you see me, flag me down, and I'll tell yeah. you about stuff. Yeah, my daughter lives <laughs> in, Manhattan, in Manhattan, so we hope to get so we can get down there. Again. Um, I'm gonna come back, get back okay. to the park, yeah. enjoy it again. Yeah. Amy, just, um, just... Is the museum open now? Yes, we're open. We're open five days a week. Yeah. Our hours are on our website. It's free entry. Uh, you can yeah, sign up for reserve time on our website. I don't know how to get my picture to show up on this thing. I'm playing around. That's why I hit the hand button. How to get my? That's a stop video on the lower left of the screen. Is that, they're sharing. Uh, how, yeah, how to get the picture of my, my, my photograph to come up. I don't know. I don't, I'm, this is new to me. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. What, what, what was in the Traveler's uh, uh, Pavilion? I remember it was a gigantic umbrella from their logo. The Traveler's, uh, Travel, Traveler's Insurance, didn't they have one? It was a red umbrella building something. There were dioramas. Uh, the first one, I think, might have been very early man's history. And then there was one of the city of Ur and about how man progressed through history through uh, dioramas. <clears throat> and there was also a record that you were given of the narration uh, that you heard when you walked through the building. Wow, Mitchell, you it really was a red that. vinyl record. <laughs> but I remember the red top of the building. I remember the, I remember that just an image of it. That's it's very, very faint. Um, I remember the big train that was there. I thought it was the 39 maybe that was there. They had they had the at the exhibit. And my friend I grew up with in Short Hills, New Jersey, his dad bought the auction stuff and he bought a pink Willie's Jeep would had pink and white uh, roof on it. It would have three speed on the on the shift lever and it was used to pull people around. And he bought one of the trams also and he had it at his house that pulled all the cars around. Oh, wow. And he bought this and brought it back to New Jersey. <laughs> and we used to play with it as kids, you wow. know. That's how I learned to drive a, a three in the tree, as they say, was that pink Jeep in the World's Fair, you know? So one thing I also wanted to mention, one reason I shared that link of that interactive map is because there's no way I could memorize what every pavilion showed and did because there's literally hundreds of exhibits. And so I think what I love about that website is, like I said, it's, a, it's the guide, but digital. So you can really, you know, kind of explore more and think about and like discover much more than I can tell you. But I think in, in this Zoom call, we have a very, very strong collective knowledge of the, of the world's fair, if I don't know the answer. Yeah, I'll and, get the yeah. Oh, Bill Powders. Well, he's on the on the there, so yay. <laughs> well, hey, Bill Cotter, Cotter, I showed a few of his photos. Yeah. I kept copyright. Can you hear me? I had my hand up. Um, I'm William Heary. Bill Heary? Oh, hi, William. Mary Calabro's husband, if you remember Mary Calabro. Yes, I do. Okay. Um, one pavilion that was still standing and in use until about three years ago was what was known as the Singer Bowl during the fair. It mm -hmm. was a big performance space. Uh, 
And after the fair closed, it was kept as a performance space and there were musical groups that played there. In 1972, I think it was, it was rededicated as Louis Armstrong Stadium with mm -hmm. a day long jazz concert. And then uh, at some point in the 19, late 70s, early 80s, it became Louis Armstrong Stadium for the tennis, US Tennis Open. And it was in use as Louis Armstrong Stadium split into two pieces, the stadium and the grandstand on, as the main pavilion or the main show space uh, until Arthur Ashe was Stadium was built. And then it was still kept as a stadium and it was only torn down about three years ago and replaced by a new stadium, which is also called Louis Armstrong Stadium. Wow. Yeah, I mean, there's so many layers of history in that right. park. It's and kind I, of crazy. I've, I've been in it in all of its life lifetimes, whatever it's been. And I even have a photograph of Louis Armstrong playing at Singer Bowl back in when the fair was open. Wow. I think we're also getting, I don't want to keep people, because we're already over time at this point. I don't know if there's any burning questions. <laughs> you, know, you can come. Last burning question. Well, Amy, it was fantastic presentation. And thank you everyone for coming and joining us. It was wonderful. Please remember we have another big, big event on Saturday, October 24th. We have live event all day long, 13 different authors. You can stay for the whole day. You can pick up your favorite author and join us for a few hours. You can sign for that program on our website, harrisonpl.org. Thank you everyone. And I hope we will see you soon for other programs that Harrison Public Library is hosting. Bye. Thank you, Amy. It was wonderful. Thank you for having me. Have a nice night, everyone.